we're going to be going over a variation um, that uh, was popularized by Fisher also. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, it was played a lot. The, um, it's the Fisher Sozin Sicilian. And um, white starts off with E4. Black plays uh, C5, Sicilian defense. And white chooses uh, Knight F3. Now, white could play pawn to F4, or white could play C3, um, or white could play um, Knight to C3, a very solid approach. And white could play G3. There are other approaches here, but this is the wide open, uh, uh, perhaps uh, arguably the most commonly pl played of all the uh, uh, variations in the Sicilian, although some of the other lines are coming, uh, coming more into vogue now. And so here black plays uh, uh, Knight C6, white plays D4, black takes. We're going to kind of transpose into this because um, this could be transposed in, um, into this line in many ways, knight f6, because uh, black actually played d6 in this game, but it doesn't matter if he plays knight c6 first or d6, you, you can en end up in the same position easily. And you'll notice here that if white tries taking the knight right now, black can take back with this pawn because white can't really push and dislodge the knight at all because black has the queen has the check with the queen to pick up the pawn but uh, so white brings his knight out to guard the center pawn and then black plays uh, d6 and now the move that makes the Fisher Sozin Sicilian um, famous well known as bishop c4 so he plays bishop c4 and black plays e6 okay and one of the points is that uh, black could have played a6 to get this line going and then played e6, although it's a little bit slower, you know, castle is fast, um, but you have, have a, the possibility of pushing the b-pawn b sooner, of course. Um, but once black plays this e6 move, he's already threatening to take the e4-pawn. Um, I take back and then black plays d5 and fork those pieces. So. That's why it explains why white plays this move and uh, why such a move in even some very, very similar variations was played so often to avoid this idea of black being able to trade, trade here and just fork and be able to remove white's um, center pawn prospects okay, um, and, and, controlling, and controlling the game there. So black plays bishop b7. And white castles and black castles. Okay, okay so we have a, a fairly subtle position. One of the mistakes that some players have made in some of these positions is try to play f4. But you've got to be very careful when you play f4 because what you do is you open up a line, you open up this diagonal, which is already directly accessible by the black queen. So if you play f4, black may already be trying moves like queen b6. And you're, this, the, the fate of the position has to be very carefully planned. Hopefully you've looked at this ahead of time to make sure you can actually get away with it. Or white can just play bishop e3, which he did in the game. And this avoids the queen coming, uh, coming to this diagonal or, or this being a weakness and, and allows white to push this f-pawn much sooner. Now there are many games too where strong players move their king over to h1 first and then play f4. That's also an alternative. But you'll also notice that a lot of the open games where white plays, um, black plays C, uh, white plays D4, the Sicilian and the open Sicilian take back the knight, that white does play an early bishop B3 in any case. Bishop C4 is actually not in vogue anymore and has been shown to be closer to equal, if not even in some variations to a slight advantage for black. So that's why it's kind of gone out of vogue. But at the, at, this, at the time in 1962, this was very popular. So <clears throat> black plays a6. So black, of course, is getting ready to expand on the queen side, but he's probably going to have to either protect the knight first because we've got pressure there, or he's going to have to trade knights first and then play b5. So white plays f4. And then black plays d5. 
Now there is a rule when you're playing the Sicilian as black that if you can get in d5 without any serious weakness, without any serious disadvantages, if you can play this um, without any trouble, then black usually equalizes. Um, nonetheless, there are definitely positions where d5 uh, is a little bit too weakening. At least, after all, after a couple exchanges, it does leave the pawn a little bit weak, but it also allows black um, uh, free or play is because is his bishop can be released after this pawn exchange, for example, and um, then g4 is accessible to the knight or the bishop. So it's um, so um, black can play d5 sometimes even when the pawn is isolated. When uh, this in this game, uh, Troinov decides to push, um, and uh, Popov uh, pushed back, uh, pushed his knight back, knight back to d7. Of course, you could try knight g4, but I would hope that you would notice that the knight could be taken in that case by the queen. And you could also try this. And um, I don't think that there's anything directly wrong with this move, but one of the issues you have to be careful of is that after the white knight exchanges for the knight in, um, the knight in e4 and black takes back with the pawn, that the bishop has a little bit more freedom. The bishop on b3, okay, would have a little bit more freedom. And you could even play for f5, for example, and try to rip open the, um, the f file. So um, black plays knight d7, okay, and white plays queen h5. Okay. Now it's kind of interesting how often these days even very, very strong players will play moves like that in an attempt to get their opponents to push the pawns forward and to weaken their position. Um, here, of course, it would be problematic for black to play g6 because even though it stops f5, it definitely weakens um, squares around the king, weakens h6, um, makes it, uh, white may even sacrifice at some point just to be able to get his uh, dark square bishop over there. You have to be very, very careful that you want to make, uh, want to push the pawns. Black is hoping, white, or I apologize, white is hoping that black will push one of these pawns and weaken the position. Um, and one of the, the, the things to notice is that since white pushed this pawn, he's managed to push this knight back. And one of the best defenders to the king side is often the knight in f6. But since white's been able to push and force that knight back, that has allowed the queen to come to this square. It um, means that white may have a little bit more um, of a chance to start some, or drum up some play on the king side, so you might uh, uh, you might uh, um, appreciate having played uh, um, f4 and in response to d5, e5, play it this way, just so you could be able to bring some pieces to the king side. And black um, plays rook to f8 or rook to e8, excuse me. And I think that the reason that black plays this is because he's probably trying to get the knight back to f8. And this would in turn, now that the knight's in the way of the bishop anyway, it's not really doing much there, um, the, and the knight isn't able to guard the king side anymore, um, maybe he's preparing for another square for the knight. The knight can return to f8, it can then guard the h7 square, which is certainly a square that um, white would love to invade on. If uh, we could, for example, get rid of, uh, get this knight out of the way, push this pawn, push, bring the bishop back, we could start to put pressure there. Or if we could bring the rook up to f3 and over to h3, we could start putting pressure over here. So you can see that h7 is often a weakness. Um, the you probably you may be familiar with a few bishop takes h7 sacrifices that are all also looming once the uh, black knight is out of the way. But one of the things that black uh, misjudges here is that once he plays rook e8, he's unguarding this pawn. So now, not only is this pawn a weakness, but this pawn is a weakness. Now if black, if white has to wait here, has to slowly build up, then maybe knight f8 might save him. Knight f8, uh, 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 g6, um, possibly, maybe he can form some kind of defense. Um, or at least he gets out, also gets out of the way of the bishop. Maybe um, black can develop his bishop and get the queen side pieces going over here. So, um, uh, so you'd think that 
um, rookie eight w uh, initially doesn't really um, is really a good idea to allow for that knight to go to f8, but it does unguard the f7 square. And so here is the theme. White's threatening the f7 with the queen, white's threatening h7 with the queen, but, uh, and right for the moment, black's very restricted. His pieces are, are a bit blocked in, even though they're doing a, a, a reasonable job of, you know, they're only one, two moves away from, um, making their way in under the queen side and perhaps in the center. Um, right now, he's a bit restricted. So at this moment, white strikes. White decides to open up this diagonal, okay? And what he does is white plays knight takes d5, okay? So let's take a look at that for a second. Um, Edgar, can you tell me um, why you think that white might be trying to sacrifice the knight for the pawn? Does it Make any sense to you? You see any anything that we can get out of this? Yes. What can we do? The, the pawn eats the knight. Uh, bishop takes pawn. Bishop takes pawn. Yeah. Okay. And then we're aiming at what? Aiming for the check on the king. Yeah, we're aiming for the check on f7. Yes. And we're aiming for the knight on c6, right? Yes. Okay. So we're threatening two things at once. Yes. Okay. And also notice that this pawn here actually has two tasks. It has to guard d5, the pawn that was there, and it has to guard this square. So actually, knight takes d5 is a common sacrifice in the Sicilian. Um, you probably, uh, perhaps, if you played the Sicilian enough times, you've probably either seen it played or you've played a knight takes d5 sacrifice to open lines. Notice that if um, when black takes, one option would be for white to play knight to f5 and be able to get, uh, perhaps get the knight into a square where it would be a little bit less comfortable for black. But um, certainly um, white's going for at least getting a couple of pawns, and notice that he's doing it at just the moment when the knight has gone back to d7, when the black rook has moved to e8, and f7 is not guarded. So <coughs> notice that when black takes, the connection here, we have the bishop on this diagonal, it's a threatening d5, and, and if the pawn were gone, it's threatening f7. And the white queen is also on f7 and h7, the very pawn that black just left undefended when he played rook to e8. And so white decides on a sacrifice, decides to try to go after the king. So Edgar, instead of taking on d5, can you see any way that White could try to sacrifice and bring the black king out of its cubby hole there behind the pawns. Go ahead and take your time. See any way we could make a sacrifice and try to get the king to come out? Queen could sacrifice. Okay. Queen could sacrifice on what square? On uh, <clears throat> F7. F7? Yeah. And that also joins in with, follows because the bishop is also in this diagonal, right? Okay, what do you think? So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you guys. So if the queen takes on f7, okay, first of all, would you be afraid if black just moved the king over to the side and didn't take your queen? The reason I ask that question first is because so many players forget to are excited about a sacrifice, forget to think about well, what if my opponent just simply doesn't take it, or realizes that. Now that I've taken it, I may be, my position may be compromised, and they may be able to go after something better or something of equal value. So are we, are we worried if we take the pawn and Black's king moves in the corner? Is that, is that bothering us, or did we do something good? What do you think? <clears throat> uh, go ahead and speak up. What would you say? Uh, they are F7. Uh huh. The king will not move on to H8. Yeah. It's going to take the king. Okay. Take the pawn. Take the pawn. Okay. So then we've got what? What material do we have for the for the uh, knight that we sacrificed earlier? We have how many pawns? Well, we got the first pawn we took right with the knight. We've got the second pawn we took with the queen. We've got a third pawn we took with the bishop. So it's looking pretty good. Also, we might have something interesting like 
Notice that with the queen here and the king in the corner, that our queen is threatening g7. See we have pressure on that? And also notice that what, um, what that pawn is guarding, in other words, once it's eliminated, that it leaves this square weak. So if I take this check and the king moves over, we could put what in this square? Once this pawn is gone. We take, this king moves over, what piece can we put in this square? We can put the, the knight. And if we put the knight there, what would it be threatening? It would be threatening the, king and the, queen. the queen and also what else? What else is the knight threatening once it gets there? Not only the queen. G7. G7? Yeah. And what else is, we, is also threatening G7? The queen, because we just tried to sacrifice it, right? So that would be pretty bad. I'm guessing for um, for black. I'm guessing he, um, he would have to do something crazy, like take take on e5. Then we take maybe we take his queen. He would take our queen. We could take back with the knight check, for example, stuff like that. Doesn't look very good for black. Already we're going to be uh, getting back our piece, and we've got quite an attack with the um, with the weak d5 pawn and the king having to come back uh, into the uh, back into the line with our pieces. So after queen takes f7, let's assume black has to take then. So he takes the queen. What would be our next move? How could we keep on going after the king? Bishop takes pawn check. <clears throat> Sorry, bishop takes pawn check. And by the way, now that we've given up the queen, what are you expecting to happen later in this game? If, uh, if you're successful, you're going to be able to get what? What are you going to be able to do? If you're giving up a whole queen, normally you better be able to do what later in the game? Checkmate. Yeah, we would hope so, right? Hopefully we're going to be able to checkmate this guy. So this, this looks like it's starting a king hunt, right? So we take the pawn. His king takes. Um, Edgar, you mentioned bishop takes d5 check. OK, so where can we go from there? Um, Edgar, Dan, what do you guys, what do you guys think? <clears throat> now, now that um, that e that e six square is, is open to go to. Well, we next. just played check. Oh, right? okay. The, the, the so the queen took the check. The king takes back. The, the we takes, play bishop takes check. Uh, Where's the king gonna go? On the uh, f eight. Yeah. Is there any other square the king can go to? No. Are you sure? You can go back to. Why not G? Right. Oh. No, because the bishop's on it, right? Oh, got it, got it. Yeah. But the king could go to G6. Yeah. So we've got two things to look at, don't we? Two, what they would call candidate moves. Two possibilities here. If the king goes to F8, let's go ahead and look at that. Then what? The knight next. To yeah, e knight e6. goes to E6, e6 check. check. What do you think, Dan? Yep. Like Edgar, that. Edgar. Okay, so knight E6 check. The king is going to have to move somewhere on this diagonal, isn't it? Let's say here, okay, to try to stay out of the way of double check. Then what? Then we take the queen check. Okay. You see it? Okay. So now we got our queen back. Okay. But do we have enough material? <coughs> well, how many pawns did we get? We got the first pawn we took. We got this pawn. And we got this pawn. And then when we play knight to queen check, he's going to probably have to move his king somewhere. And we're going to have to figure this out again. If he, um, if he moves the king back to there, then the knight can come to here check, force him back on this diagonal somewhere. And then when the king moves back, we can move our knight here and be threatening what? Both of the rooks. So even though, so we got three pawns for the piece and it looks like we're going to win the... Uh, when at least the exchange as well, okay? And looks like maybe more. And uh, uh, the other the other issue is if we if the king, if we play queen takes pawn check, the king takes, we play bishop takes check, the king goes to g6, okay? So what if the king goes here, then what? Then the pawn from f5. Okay, so Edgar is saying f5 check, what do you think? Okay, so we push check. He can't take it with his king because it's guarded by the rook. rook and the knight, right? So can his king go here or here? 
It's checkmate. <laughs> is it checkmate? No. Are you sure? What do you guys think? Oh no, it's gonna move again on the. Uh, yeah, I can't go here or here because this bishop it's is fine. exposed when we push the pawn with check, right? But the king will go to h5. Okay. So now we're going to have to figure out how to polish him off. What are we going to do now as king went to h5? What piece can we attack him with? What color square is this king on? White. Okay, do we have any pieces that naturally attack on white squares? Yes, uh, the, the bishop. Like the, the bishop, yeah. the white bishop. Okay. Can you see a square that we can go after? Yes. What would you say? Oh, yeah. Bishop, uh, F7. F3. Okay, so Edgar says F3. Dan says F7. Let's try F7 check. Can he block that check in any way? Uh, yes. Yeah, I can push the pawn to G6, can he? I'm not saying that he's um, necessarily not going to be mated anyway. Because, it, because I'm guessing with very, very careful play, you'll probably be able to man him anyway with something like G4 check or something. But Bishop F3 check seems a little bit more direct because he has nothing to block, right? Does that kind of make sense, Dan? Yeah. And then, Edgar, where's the king going to go once we check on F3? Going to, going to go to H4. Okay. Now do we have another way to put him in check? Yes. <clears throat> This knight? Yes. Okay, where's the knight go to? To here? To here? Or to here? No. That was in the other variation where we'd play bishop takes check. Oh, okay. And the king went to f8, right? Okay. Yeah. But this time we're playing bishop takes check and the king's going to g6. Okay. Then we push the pawn check, right? Okay. King comes up to h5. Yeah. Now we're playing bishop there check. That's you guys right. like yeah. that one, right? Yeah. King goes to h4. And then b sharp. We're going to play bishop to f2 check. Yeah. Now as you move a piece, always be thinking about what was that piece doing before you moved it. This bishop was covering that square. So if you play bishop here check, he can go back, can't he? I'm not saying it doesn't work, but... Okay. Um, we haven't done that yet. Nobody suggested that. Okay, so we play bishop back to f3 check. King goes to h4. And now what are you guys suggesting? G3 check? Okay, so where can his king go now? Can the king go back to this square? No. No, because the bishop, right? right yeah. King can't go back to any of these squares because of this bishop, right? Yeah. So the king has to go to h3. Now where can we put him in check? <laughs> He's in what color now? So yeah, because on the white so the bishop that was over on um, F3? F3, you got a yeah, G2. G2 check? Okay, good. King goes back to G4. Okay. Or can we put him in check again? <clears throat> now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm having a lot of fun here. <laughs> I'd be having a lot of fun trying to figure out, okay, what's the most fun way to put to get him in checkmate? Okay. And I can see that he's a very much he's very much cut off from getting back, isn't he? He's yeah. definitely in our territory, and we just have to find the right creative arrangement of pieces to checkmate him. So, we put we play bishop g2 check last as king went back to g4. Do you see, where, let me ask you a question, where is this pawn right now? On the, That's there, yeah. right? Yeah. His king is here. Oh, we have this pawn here. Oh gosh, the rook. Can we do, ah, rook what? Rook to f4. Rook to f4 check. What do you think, Edgar? Rook to f4 check? Yeah. Okay. So I play rook to f4 check. Where can the king go now? Well, he can go back to g, g, g5. G5, right? or what else? You can also go to Probably not g5. h5. The, the, uh, oh, yeah. No, because the rook blocks off h5, the bishop when he plays there, right? H5. You can go to h5 or g5, right? 
Okay, so we got to look at both of those. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at G5. Suppose he goes to G5. Now remember, we've got a pawn here. Our white square bishop is now here, right? Our rook went up there to say check. We've got two pawns here and here. Yeah. His king is here. Check. How? Close to, to H4 check. Do you see the? Do you see the how it's check? There, Dan. Oh, so he opens up the bishop, which threatens yeah. check. Right, right, right. And where does he go from there? Close to H4. Now, uh, Edgar's saying that's checkmate. What do you think? No, not check. Oh, yeah, I think so. yeah, yeah, next to yeah, the, the pawn's up there. He can't yeah, go. the pawn's up here. He can't go back, right? Yeah. yeah. Can't go back, and this bishop's covering all the dark squares. Right. Yeah. So the rick one over here, that's checkmate, isn't that's it? Checkmate. Yeah. Yep. So we know that he can't go king to g5. So once we play rook to f4 check, his king is going to have to go to h5. Right? Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, so now where do we have another check? <clears throat> We could check on h4, right? Um, what can he do now? No more mate. Is that mate? Yeah, because it's open away. The pawn from f4. To so f4. where's his king right now in your mind? King's on h5, right? Pawns on f5. Pawns on g3. And this rook went to there. Check. Yeah. So that's checkmate. Definitely. Yeah. I don't think it's checkmate. Because he can oh. go back down to. He can take it. He can take it. But I want you to go a step further. Let's let him take it. You play your rook there, check. That's the only move he has, isn't it? Okay. And then the bishop. And then your what bishop? The bishop on on g2. He's saying goes up to f3, check. Yeah. Let's see. And where's he go? No more. Then he goes to no more. No we more. pushed this pawn up to there, didn't we? Yeah. Isn't this pawn here? Yeah. So if we play bishop there, check. Mate. And his bishop here took our rook. We play bishop check. Where can he go? Uh, what do you guys three. think? Yeah. Bishop f3. Yeah, check bishop mate. f3. Mate. Right. No, check mate. Do you see it? Yeah. It's check mate. All right. You sacrifice first the rook, and then you check the bishop. I go the bishop to f3. Check right. Mate. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Guys, you guys did a great job. <laughs> I'm really happy with this. But I can tell you right now that what I normally do with my students is I do push them. If I can get them, if I can get them analyzing two, three moves comfortably, then I want to get them analyzing four moves comfortably, five moves. And after a while, of course, counting the moves isn't such a big deal. It's the it's the getting your mind over this idea that you can't really see ahead very far. It's true that the the nearer or the closer your analysis is to the current position, if you're only two moves away or something, you have a better idea of what's going on because you can take some of the clues from what's on the board and what's on your mind. But when you get ten moves down the road, you know it can be very very different complexion. Um, the the position on the board may not even seem to really gel with you anymore. You have to at some point you have to break away. But the nice thing about analysis is you can always go back to the initial position, right? And then try to work your way through the candidate moves. So let's go ahead and play through that. Let's see how that works. Uh, let's play queen takes f7 check. We said if the king goes here, what do we say would happen, guys? Knight to e6, right? Because And then we're threatening what? Checkmate. <clears throat> then the queen, we're threatening checkmate. And the only move that I see that he really has, since obviously he can't just move the queen, right, and let us checkmate him, is to play here with the knight. You could try there and try to hit the knight. There's one thing, and he's hitting our queen. Mm -hmm. However, what do we do? After he, queen. After he plays knight, takes e5 and threatens our queen, what could he do? If he took this pawn, yeah. what do we do? Yeah, but he, oh. Oh, wait. 
Oh, we yeah, don't it's take checkmate. It. Yes, it's checkmate. Yeah. yeah, it's an illusion, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Okay. For him to stop the checkmate, he's going to have to do what? He's going to have to guard this square. So what is he going to guard the square with? Bishop to f6, bishop to f8, rook to g8. But all those moves are going to be a problem for him because we're going to follow with what? If he plays rook to g, rook to g8, for example, we have what? Oh. If he manages to put his rook over here and guard the checkmate, yeah. what are we going to do? We're going to hit the, the, the queen. Yeah, but you're oh, going to snap the queen up, right? Takes queen. So him guarding g7, yeah. guarding the checkmate, isn't really helping him a lot, is it? It's, we just take the queen and yeah. clearly there's no, doesn't look like there's any compensation here for a whole queen, uh, queen for a knight. He, even if he, you know, if he comes back and takes it with, you know, like the bishop or the rook, it's, it's obviously very, very bad for him, right? Okay, so let's go back. Okay, and let's assume that instead, of course, he takes the queen, like you guys were analyzing. And then you said we do what, guys? <coughs> bishop takes pawn check. And now we said the king has two candidate moves. The king can either go where? Either F8 or G6. And I think the easier one we analyzed first was to F8, right? So it goes to F8, and then we do what? Knight to E6 check. This drives the king onto this diagonal, doesn't it? So that when the knight moves, next move, the bishop will be checking the king. So whether than put himself in a place to be double checked, right? He goes here, but it doesn't really matter. We still take the queen check. Now, right now we have to evaluate this. This probably is the best variation since certainly the other variation left him mated, checkmated, right? Okay. But uh, how is this going to work? Well, he could move his king here, and he could move his king here. You might remember that during uh, just a minute ago we said if his king goes here we could do what? And and I apologize, let me ask you a question. What's the material here? Who's ahead, who's behind? Okay. Let me, now, now I can tell by watching your lips, Dan, you're counting these pieces. Okay, what I'd like you to do, do is this, and Edgar, I'm trying to make sure that you know this too. Um, when you, when you're um, trying to find out who's ahead and who's behind, then most of the time you want to compare the pieces. In other words, I'm going to compare the bishop for the bishop, bishop for bishop, you see it? Knight for knight. So it looks like black has an extra knight. With me? Rook for rook. Rook for rook. I've got two pawns for black here, two pawns for white here. It looks like this might be an extra. Are you with me? There's an extra pawn. I've got two pawns here and against two pawns here. So it looks like these two are also extras. So it looks like white has what? Three pawns for the piece. So if we get anything more for this, then we're definitely winning, right? And we said during, we said during the analysis, we said, well, we can bring the knight back here, check rather than just taking here to try to win a pawn, we could come back here, check, right? Drive that king on this diagonal again, and this time what? Knight, and actually that's a check, isn't it? Okay, and then of course, after he answers the check, we can take this rook for free, right? So, going back, um, for, again, let's suppose that when we play this check, he plays um, he plays king g8. We play a knight takes queen check. What if he goes king to the corner? What do you guys think about that? <clears throat> now I didn't analyze this variation because I saw some transposition. So, what do you guys think? Oh, well, then you can just come back. Yeah, check. come back to, yeah, yeah, to F7, to check. F7 check. Yeah. You guys want to try that? 
Okay. And the king goes over here. Right. Now what do you want to try? Knight to where? D6 check. You see why he wants to do that? Okay, because we're going after what? We're going after the rook. So, so he doesn't lose the rook for free, he's going to have to move his king where? Uh, oh, next to the rook. Yeah, he's going to have to move it next to it. And then we're, we can go after the rook, right? And then we're going to get a rook for a knight. And since we were already equal, it seems like we are we're ahead, right? Okay. So this is probably the best variation, nonetheless, for black. At least he, even, even though he's going to be exchanged down, and it's going to be a very restricted position for him. White's going to have these very far pushed past pawns that are going to be very difficult for him to deal with, although he might be able to establish a foothold with the bishop here or something. Um, it's going to be pretty bad for him. It's not, and not at all good for uh, black. But let's go back. Whoop. Let's just go forward. Can we just go forward? That was awesome. Okay, did we? Now let's just kind of play it through it real quick. E4, C5. You guys remember what the next move is? Knight 2, okay. F3. Okay, and black plays either knight C6, or he could, or I think in the game he actually played D6. Okay, and then we do what? D4. Okay, this is one way for white to play. Remember that white can play this, though, or bishop C4, or then the strong, the, block, the solid knight C3, um, which are pretty popular these days. White takes back. Black plays knight here. White, of course, defends the pawn. And black plays, you guys remember? Knight. Nice, nice. Knight to c6. So this is the position we got. Then we play the Sozin Sicilian. S-O-Z-I-N. And Fisher Sozin Sicilian. Fisher made this popular. So his name was attached to it. Sozin was also a, a famous grandmaster back in the 60s and so on and so forth. Um, so play bishop c4, black plays e6. And f4. Okay, not f4. Once black plays this, he's getting ready for a sham sacrifice. Now what I mean by sham sacrifice is where you oh. take something and then if they take back, you get it. Nine, yeah, he's getting ready for to take this. You see it? Because after that, with that pawn there, he can take this, the knight takes, yeah. then possibly play d5. <clears throat> now it's not quite that simple because you have to look at moves like bishop b5 and so on and so forth. But you can see that this is a, that it could be a problem. So often, white played the bishop back, okay, to avoid this capture, okay, which he did in this game. And then black played bishop b7. And both players castle their king. And now your move. Edgar, do you remember what white played? Bishop e3. Because if we play f4, we open up this diagonal, right? And it's not, not we have to analyze it, but black, it looks like black could play queen there and perhaps cause us a little bit of trouble. Okay? I think that white would actually be okay personally, but uh, it doesn't, it looks like it could be trouble, so often white's playing this move or moving the king over so that he's off that diagonal just before playing f4. But in this case he plays bishop e3, very practical developing move. Um, black plays a6, getting ready to expand on the queen side, b5, possibly trade knights in b5, and now white plays f4. And now black tries the move which might equalize in a lot of variations of the Sicilian. You remember the move that black, if he gets it in without any trouble? D5, right? D5. And white decides not to trade pawns. Okay, yeah, he decides to push E5. Because if you're trading, notice that you're also opening that bishop's diagonal, aren't you? You're actually freeing Black's position a little bit, even though you get a nice, juicy, isolated pawn, which uh, you may or may not be able to exploit yet. It's kind of hard. Looks like it's going to be a little bit difficult, but you may be able to. But 
um, um, here White chooses to push the pawn and dislodge a very important defender of the king's side. It's not only defending this square, but it's also defending these squares and so black and black decides he doesn't want to play here in which case white could take take and he might even be able to play f5 at some point and try to rip open this uh, this diagonal okay also knight takes c6 leaves pawn, black's pawns a little bit shaky might uh, still be able to hold it, but it's a little bit shaky. I'm, I'm guessing, however, because there's only a pair of bishops for each player and the position is still a bit open, it probably would be closer to a draw. Don't do that. If we, oh, okay, so now I know something not to do, right? So I'll play these moves real quick. Maybe you can see if you remember them. This might be a blessing in disguise because it gets you guys to really know this opening well, doesn't it? Okay, knight f6, he hits the e pawn, knight c3, knight c6, and he plays the Sosan Sicilian, which is bishop c4. He plays e6, and now to stop this to stop the sacrifice of the knight, he brings his bishop back. Brings his bishop out and they castle. White plays bishop e3 to watch the diagonal. Black plays a6 to start to expand on the queen side. And white plays f4. Black tries to equalize with d5. White pushes e5, and black decides, no, I'm not going to go for knight e4, I'm going to play knight d7. And then queen h5. And once again, it's very common um, for players to make moves which seem like they don't really threaten much at first, but they encourage your opponent to push and weaken pawns. And if we get him to push and weaken pawns on the king side, then we may have some targets, right? We may have something to attack. We may have squares that we can get our pieces in. Like if he pushed his pawn here, then this square would be weak, right? But what he does is he chooses to make this move. Unfortunately, even though this allows for the knight to move back, it does undefend f7, doesn't it? Okay. And so now we sack. Okay, we get to get this going. Then we sacrifice here. He takes. We play check. He, we decide he moves his king out here. Or that's what happened in the game anyway. And we played f5 check. King can, can't go here or here because of the bishop, right? So he's got to go to h5. And then you brought the bishop back here, check. Remember, at first we were looking at this check, but it looks like the pawn could at least try to block. I don't think that black, I'm guessing black wouldn't survive anyway, but he would have a better chance if he could start blocking. But we play check and we're forcing the king in here really close to our pieces, aren't we? And now we play the g3 check and look where he is now. He's like his king is almost ready to, ready to visit us, right? Our king is visiting his king. And now I brought the bishop back check, which cleared what piece out of the way? Cleared out of the way of the rook. You played your rook f4 check. Do you, first of all, do you guys remember what happens on that one? What happens? Okay, I think knight f3 is okay, but there is a, a quicker way, a better way. Yeah, rook to h4, because that clears the path for the bishop, and rook's carding this square and this square. He's checkmated. So we can't go there. Okay, so we want to back up. He goes king here instead, and we do what? Yeah, now we, we sacrifice. I mean, we'd love to play bishop here check right now, but then he can go to this diagonal. However, if we played it that way, would that work? Yeah. Where does king go? Go to here or here. I think we already know what happens when he goes here, right? That's right. Then you just bring the rook back over. Yeah. So what happens if he goes king here, though? Would that work? Yeah. But what happens? Yeah, the rook back over. Goes to h4 check. And then when he takes our rook, then what happens? 
He cannot take the rook because when we remove that rook, we also check him with the bishop. It's a double check, right? It's a double check and checkmate. So he could have played it that way, but what happened was remember here, instead he played check, which is actually what Trainov did. Remember, this is a. Uh, Tr Trainov uh, was playing white and Popov was playing black. And black takes, and then how do we finish him off? Bishop to f3, checkmate. Yeah, he's, he doesn't have any squares right now, does he? No. There's no, no squares except for this one, and when we check him there, we cover that one too. Yeah. What do you guys think? Good right. game? Awesome. Neat. All right, guys. Okay. All right. Good game. Good job. <laughs>